Welcome back, everyone, to the Almedina track. Uh, we now have a session uh, presented by Meet, uh, which is joining us from the UK. Is uh, a developer advocate at Google, especially for Google Cloud, if I'm not mistaken. And Guillaume, which, which joins us from uh, France, and also a developer advocate at Google, and also for Google Cloud, I think. <laughs> yes. Um, so they'll be presenting uh, on choreography versus, versus orchestration in serverless microservices. So the path from monolith to microservices, pros, cons, challenges, and how to overcome them. Um, and I guess it's going to be a pretty rich um, session on this experience. So guys, without further delays, uh, give you the stage, or actually, in this case, I'll give you the stream. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not the stage. <laughs> Thank you very much. So hello, everybody. Uh, we're happy to be there, if only virtually, with you. So we'll be talking about choreography and orchestration in serverless microservices. So uh, we're not going to speak about that kind of choreography or orchestration. So there's no you know, ballet dancing or uh, musical instruments involved. Um, instead, instead, we'll be speaking about um, microservices, how to orchestrate them or make them collaborate together and the different approaches. So for example, let's, let's think about a, a simple e-commerce kind of transaction where we would have a, a web front end that talks to a payment processor. Then uh, the order is going to be shipped when the parts are ready. And then we are going to notify the customer. One way to do it would be to have each service call each other in a kind of a chain. So front end calling the payment processor, payment processor saying, oh, I'm ready. Uh, hey, shipper, please ship the, this order and notification, etc." There are uh, pros and cons to that kind of simple approach. So um, first, it's better than a monolith in the sense that we already split uh, in different services uh, the overall transaction, the overall process. And also it's easy to implement because you know it's usually fairly straightforward to have service uh, that calls another service. But on the downside, uh, there's really too much coupling between all the services because what happens if there's one in the chain that fails, it's not ideal uh, and the, the whole transaction is going to, to fail. Uh, how do we ensure that this transaction is successful in the end uh, if it broke like in the middle? Uh, also, another concern is the, the fact that um, if you want to do to apply some retry, timeout logic, etc., you'd have to do that uh, at each service, uh, calling the next service. Uh, so it would also add you know, some, some bloat into the, the code of the service to know perhaps too much about how the, the next service in the chain is going to work or not work, actually. So it's, it's not ideal. Instead, if you use a, a choreography approach, which, which is, let's say, a synonym of a, an even-driven approach where you use a message broker instead of having services talk to each other directly. So here in this case, you are just exchanging some kind of messages, like messages on a pub sub topic, for example. Uh, on some kind of broker, whether it's a Google Cloud PubSub or let's say Apache Kafka, etc. Uh, here, instead, we, ch we exchange messages. So the front end is going to send a message asking, uh, okay, I've got a, an order. Uh, and then the payment processor is going to pick that message. Oh yeah, I can treat that. I'm going to charge, authorize and charge the credit card, etc. And there's a we use that message broker to pass information between the services. So there's no direct coupling between the services and the services can, can stay independent. This is great, although when you have a more complex transaction, more complex process, when it's not you know, one after the other, uh, each service being called, being uh, you know, activated in a way, uh, in a more complex uh, uh, situation where you have to ask the inventory uh, database about uh, what's left uh, in stock or not. You have to potentially contact a supplier's API, a third-party API to replenish the stock. You're going to update your, your own inventory and order database, perhaps use a third-party service again, like SendGrid to send emails or a Slack API if you want to notify, for example, the sales rep. Then uh, the, the, the flow of messages that actually make the, the business transaction 
are quite complicated to follow and it's hard to understand uh, the, the actual you know, flow charts that we have drawn here on, on screen. So the pros, services are loosely coupled, which is great because there's not a, a tight coupling, which means services can be changed, evolved, developed, deployed and scaled independently of each other. Uh, we also don't have a single point of failure because, you know, a uh, service fails, but at some point it, it will be back up. But uh, the, the messages will still be there in the message broker in the queue or topic to be picked up once the service is back on. And also what's great with a choreography and even driven approach is that uh, events are really easy to extend um, or, or add new, a, new, a, new, uh, a new event, a new message in the system or add new subscribers to an existing message and, and topic, it's fairly easy to extend and expand uh, an, an existing system. In the cons, uh, I would list the fact that it's difficult to monitor the whole system because, well, there are messages going in each and every direction. How do you ensure that you follow the, the, you know, the flow chart of uh, the business transaction? Also, things like error, retries, timeouts are... Uh, complicated, you might have to put that logic perhaps at the topic level, you can configure the, the, the topic with, with such settings, but that means that it's at the topic level and not necessarily per transaction. Perhaps different transactions, different business processes might have different needs in terms of errors, retries, etc. So yeah, the, the business flow, the business process is not captured ex explicitly, so there's no way to version that in, a, in Git, for example. Um, and also again, like in the previous approach, uh, who ensures that the whole transaction is successful? You might have messages waiting in a queue. Perhaps we'd need another service that tracks the status of all these messages still left in the queue. Uh, but, but it's uh, more logic to, to get that uh, in, a, in, a, in a good shape. Thanks, Guillaume, for the introduction to choreography. And, um, so as you've seen, um, one approach we could have taken is just services calling each other and that works and it's simple to implement, but it has some drawbacks. So then we can use an event-driven kind of system, but the pros and cons are also, uh, you, as you see here, uh, the, the biggest con for event-driven system is that things become really complicated to monitor and kind of make sure everything works as expected. Um, so what, what else can you do? Um, well, what you can do is that um, there's this uh, new approach called orchestration. And the idea with orchestration is that, you know, when, and when a request comes into to your front end, uh, instead of your front end calling the services or instead of the front end um, sending a message to a message worker, what it can do is that it can start an it can start an orchestration. And this orchestration uh, is usually done with an orchestrator, an external service that has a definition of what should happen. And then the orchestrator is the one making sure that the services are called in the order that they're supposed to be called. So in this case, the order comes to the front end, then that kicks off the orchestration that goes to the orchestrator and the orchestrator will call the payment processor, make sure that that, that completes get the results, then it will call the shipper and it will call the notifier, right? Now in this model, the pros and cons is that first of all, you have this orchestrator capturing the business flow, flow centrally. And this is really important. Um, having this business logic captured centrally, it allows uh, you first of all to have a single place where you can look at the business lo logic, but also it allows you to source control that. So you can have different versions of your business control, uh, business flow, right? And that has a lot of benefits. Secondly, um, your orchestrator has these steps uh, that they call services. So each step can be individually monitored. You can have um, a centralized error, retry and timeout logic, right? Because um, for, um, for each service, you want to be able to um, you want to be able to do certain um, error handling and certain retries and, and timeouts, right? Uh, you can you can do this individually in each service, but usually that's not what you want. You probably want to be able to apply global 
error retry and timeout logic and orchestrator helps for that because you can define these in orchestrator and they can be applied to each service um, globally instead of individual services mm -hmm. implementing them. And then in the orchestration, um, you can use simple REST. Um, one of the problems with event-driven systems is that, you know, with events, you, you usually have multiple event formats. And with that, you probably need to have multiple event parsing logic, right? So pretty quickly, things get quite complicated. Whereas in orchestration, you can make your services understand just plain HTTP and make your orchestrator call those services with plain HTTP. So that tends to simplify things a little bit. And the good news is that, you know, when you're orchestrating, uh, your services are still independent. They're still deployed independently. They can be upgraded independently. They can be scaled independently, um, but they're part of an orchestration. Um, so in a way you're creating a monolith where your services are um, kind of still independent and that has benefits, you know? So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. So you're, you're the, in the, the independence of the services, but at the same time, the tight coupling that you, you need in your orchestration. Now, on the other hand, uh, orchestrator is another service that you need to worry about, you need to learn. Um, so that's given. Um, orchestrator could be a single point of failure um, because at the end of the day, it's just another service in your system. So you need to make sure that you're using an orchestrator service that's resilient and redundant and all that kind of stuff. Because if it orchestrator doesn't work, then nothing will work in your system. And the fact that you will be relying on REST with orchestration means that your system will be more tightly coupled. You know, it's not going to be like eventing where, where you can just add a service and just, you know, have your service just show up in your system uh, with minimal hassle. Uh, in orchestration, you need, you, you need to deploy your service, but you need to also change your orchestrator and, and your orchestration definition to take that service into your orchestration. So you have more tight coupling, but that's kind of the point of orchestration. You want that tight coupling a little bit more than eventing, right? And then at this point, you might be wondering, okay, we learned about choreography, we learned about orchestration, which one is better? Which one should I use? And the answer is, as in every software engineering question is, it depends, right? It really depends on what you're, what you're trying to do and what, what is more important to you. But as a general rule of thumb, if you if your services are not close related, um, so let's say in our example, we had um, a payment processor and we also had a notifier. I mean, these services, they don't really need to know about each other. They don't really need to worry about each other. So if you have that kind of services, usually it's better to use e choreography or event-driven kind of architecture to put them together because they don't need to really know, know about each other. And also in cases where your services can um, exist in different contexts. For example, again, the notification service can be part of a checkout process, but at the same time, maybe it's also part of some other kind of um, process where you need to notify at the end, right? So it can exist in different contexts. For those kind of use cases, then if you use eventing, it will be easier because you will be able to plug in your services uh, in a much easier and flexible way. Now, if you have a business logic um, where you can describe it as a flowchart, like the flowchart that Guillaume showed you, where you can see that, you know, depending on certain states, you want to take certain branches and then at certain steps, you, you want to be able to call external services. So you can easily visualize your business flow, then maybe it makes sense to capture that in orchestration. Because if that business flow is set and you want to be able to trace through the business flow in your system, then orchestration usually uh, is the answer. Um, if your services are closely related, so for example, um, if you have a payment processor and a shipper that always go together, right? Because you, every, before you ship, you need to charge and, and after you charge, you need to ship, right? So if that's always the case, um, it, it is good to put that in orchestration um, and still keep their independence because these services should be independent because should be independent because they're doing in like different things, right? And finally, um, if you don't want to deal with the complexity of event parsing and, and different eventing formats, and you, if you want to just stay in plain rest, 
and orchestration is probably a good solution as well. And then you, you can also take a hybrid approach, right? Um, you don't really need to choose um, one or the other. Instead, what you can do is that for things that make sense to orchestrate it, you can put them in orchestration. And then once that orchestration and that is done, you can notify other orchestrations with events. So you can see that here we have a, a few orchestrations and then each one, when they're done, they can send a message that can be picked by other orchestrations. So this is a hy hybrid approach as well, where you, co you combine both orchestration and choreography. And usually this, this could work. I mean, because in your system, depending on how complicated your system is, sometimes you want things to be orchestrated and sometimes you don't. And you can kind of pick and choose what parts of, parts of your architecture should be orchestrated. And if for other parts, you can just use simple eventing to notify others. All right, so hopefully this gives you a good idea on choreography and orchestration. Now Guillaume will take over and let you know about the landscape in, in both of these approaches. So I'll stop sharing right now. Thank you. So you should be seeing my screen now, I guess. All right. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the landscape. Um, in terms of choreography and even driven solutions, all the uh, cloud providers provide different solutions, different products, whether it's um, AWS with SQS, SNS, even Bridge, Azure with even Grid, even bus, uh, uh, even uh, hubs and service bus, not the other way around. Uh, with Google Cloud, you have PubSub, uh, which provides topics, subscriptions, etc. cetera. Uh, but you also have another uh, fairly recent product, uh, which is Event Arc, which is a great way to uh, link sources and syncs together uh, using uh, cloud audit logs. You can send uh, events uh, to cloud run services, which run uh, containers in a serverless fashion. Uh, but there are also many other uh, really great solutions, especially in the open source space. For example, Apache Kafka or uh, Pulsar or uh, RabbitMQ Nats in the, in the Go world. So you've got plenty of options for message-driven approaches, basically. In terms of orchestration, um, so there, there are good old, uh, I often get that remark, uh, good old orchestrators uh, or that are part of uh, ESBs, things like that. Uh, in the cloud, you also have step functions for AWS, which works with uh, Amazon Lambda. You've got logic apps uh, in Azure. On Google Cloud, you also have different options. Cloud Composer, for example, is it's based on Apache Airflow. It's more for data-driven kind of pipelines and workflows. Uh, you are also able to run things like Kubeflow uh, machine learning pipelines on Kubernetes clusters. But the one we're going to uh, look into in a little bit more detail, it's Workflows, uh, Google Cloud Workflows, uh, which is an orchestrator and which works great for um, any kind of API, including Google Cloud APIs, your own uh, business logic running on Google Cloud resources, as well as third-party APIs or APIs, REST services that are available anywhere else. Another thing uh, you should keep an eye on that's uh, the serverless workflow specification. So it's part of the, currently it's just a, a sandbox uh, level project at the CNCF uh, Foundation. Uh, it's a specification and it tries to uh, define, um, well, as I, as I, on, the, on the screen, a declarative and domain specific workflow language to really describe your workflow uh, in a portable way. So portable, yes and no, because uh, all those workflow products or solutions that we mentioned will have to implement that specification in order for that specification to be portable. Uh, but I am seeing this kind of like a Venn diagram where you have what the uh, serverless workflow specification supports in terms of features and the features that are supported by the tool that you want to use, the orchestrator that you want to use. And if you want something portable, it should be the uh, intersection of those two bubbles, uh, basically. Uh, another aspect, so, and uh, the, the fact is that let's say there's a special built-in function, which is part of, of the product that you really rely on in your workflow definition. Perhaps it's not uh, standardized as part of the specification. So making 
your workflow definition uh, essentially not portable. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is the fact that you may be using REST indeed for your services, uh, but perhaps you're not using open API specifications to describe your services. And uh, the fact is that uh, serverless workflow, the serverless workflow specification relies on open API. So would have you would have to, to go the extra mile and define the, the whole API contract in the shape of an open API document for uh, your service uh, contract. Now let's uh, uh, introduce you to Google Cloud Workflows. So Google Cloud Workflows is a way to orchestrate and integrate any kind of uh, APIs. Uh, as I said, it can be APIs or services that are hosted uh, on Google Cloud, for example, um, serverless products like Cloud Run, Cloud Functions, Google App Engine. You can also call uh, APIs, uh, Google, any Google and Google Cloud APIs, because all, all those services, all those products expose some REST API. But you can also call external APIs on other cloud providers, on premises, uh, as long as it's reachable through the internet. Um, any API can be orchestrated. How it works is, uh, so let's come back to our example where you have a, a, a process with a, a payment processor, a shipper service, a notifier service. That's three steps, three sequential steps here. And you would define that with those three steps, those three lines, process payment, ship items, notify user in the YAML definition file. You can, you can use YAML or JSON syntax. And then this first step would call for example, here it would be a Cloud Run service, but could be any URL. You can also pass uh, some data. So for example, here uh, I have some payment details coming from uh, perhaps the argument of the, of the workflow of some other variable in the, in the workflow. Then this service is going to return uh, a response. So you can put the response into this variable here. Then in the next service that is also called with the HTTP post, the URL, etc. In input, you can reuse the output of the previous service. So, for example, perhaps I need uh, process dot uh, process result dot body dot uh, order dot customer dot uh, address. For example, here I just use the body, uh, the, the full body, but it could be just specific parts. There's a syntax for accessing uh, parts of the body of uh, another service. And, uh, and so on, then you, in a sequence, those steps are going to, to be called. But they are, so step sequencing, that's, that's really the, what, what I've just explained. What else can you do in your workflow definition? You can introduce some poses. For example, you know that some service may take some time. Perhaps you're going to introduce a, a one minute pose because you want to wait a little bit to ensure that the, 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 the shipper has really finished uh, getting the order ready for shipping. Uh, variable parsing and JSON par passing and JSON parsing, that's what I explained. You can really pass data between different API calls. And uh, let's say the payment processor sometimes fails or you have to retry. So you could specify at the workflow definition level and on a per workflow uh, basis. So different workflows may have different requirements or um, configuration for retry, back off logic, etc. So for example, I know that sometimes it fails. So perhaps I'm ready to retry five times before abandoning. I can define, define a back off strategy. For example, I'm going to retry in one second, in two seconds, four seconds, can define a multiplier, for example. Also, you can take care of uh, exception handling and error handling. So for example, if the shipper service fails and returns some four, four or something or 500 uh, status code, perhaps you're gonna go into uh, an error branch of your workflow, and then you're going to call the pager of the support team or the uh, SREs working on your system. If it works great, if it's successful, uh, then you're going to call the notifier service, which notifies the customer that they are going to receive their, their order. And uh, beyond just the error exception handling and such, you can also have branches, uh, I would say normal branches, a bit like if, uh, if then else kind of blocks or switch 
uh, instructions. So you can, for example, call the inventory database and say and ask if uh, the, the product is still in stock or not. If it's not out of stock, then you can ship the, the order. If it's out of stock, then I'm going to branch into another step, another branch of my workflow to request from the supplier uh, some new parts for, for my order. Then I'm going to update the inventory, et cetera. So you can really have some business logic uh, with if then else that checks what's, uh, uh, you know, what's returned by previous uh, service calls. For example, a read inventory would return, okay, a number of items, uh, zero out, oh, then I need to call the supplier API. So you check from uh, with some rich expressions what's inside the, the responses of the, the previous API calls. Other useful features uh, I'd like to mention, sub workflows, for example, when you have parts of your workflow definitions that are common, that you reuse several times, instead of jumping back to them or something like this, you can define sub workflows, which is pretty much like a function call, a procedure call, a method call. You would just reuse and put that in a, in a sub workflow. That's the name of the feature, but that's a good name. Uh, you would reuse and call that sub workflow at different parts of your main workflow definition. The other thing I'd like to mention br briefly in passing, it's uh, still in beta right now, it's connectors. I mentioned that you can call any Google API or Google Cloud API uh, with their REST interfaces. Uh, but for some of those APIs, some of those services, there are dedicated connectors that exist. And what's nice with that, so it simplifies the, the call syntax a little bit, but what's more interesting is how it handles uh, retry or waiting for uh, the execution of an operation, a particular operation, a long running operation in particular uh, of that API. Let me take an example. If you want to use workflows to automate your IT infrastructure, your cloud uh, resources, for example, starting or stopping a VM, a compute engine a virtual machine, for example, it can take quite a bit of time and in order to uh, ensure that um, you wait for the, the VM to be stopped, instead of polling and checking, so is the VM stop? Wait five seconds. Is the VM stop? No, wait five seconds, etc. Instead of implementing that polling logic yourself, all those long running operations are handled automatically by the connectors. So they actually uh, take care of waiting for long running operations. So other examples could be uh, uh, database imports or things like that, which are operations that, that, take, a, that take a while. So um, connectors are a useful feature. Uh, what else? Uh, if you use the, the command line on the gcloud SDK, you can use the gcloud workflow, workflows commands with the deploy, execute, and uh, describe subcommands to deploy a particular definition file and check for the particular execution ID of the of a running uh, workflow execution. And you also have uh, at your disposal in the cloud console, uh, this UI. So you write your YAML definition on the left, but there's also a nice visual, visualization on the right, which shows the, the various um, branches and steps in a visual fashion, which is great because sometimes for authoring uh, workflow definitions. It's a YAML file, so it's not necessarily easy to see where you're going to go next uh, in the workflow. So having a visual representation can be pretty uh, handy. Uh, let's, so I thought that was me, but um, or perhaps yeah, I went too far. Maybe I'll take over this. Yeah, this okay, <laughs> let's do this. So let me see if I can share my screen um, this time. So I took a bit of your slides. <laughs> Sorry. Can you Hopefully you can see my slides. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's it's fine now. Cool. So I learned how to share a screen in uh, <laughs> in places, so that's good. That's cool. the session uh, right there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So after seeing all all the theory behind choreography and orchestration and pros and cons, and talking about Google Cloud workflows, now let's actually finish off the presentation by looking at a case study um, about an application that me and Guillaume we actually wrote initially using an event-driven architecture. And then later, when workflows became av available, we rewrote that in, in, in an orchestrated kind of approach. 
and the things that we kind of learn along the way. Um, so that's what I want to cover here. And then, so I, I will sh show you the app and I will talk about what the different approaches. And then I think Guillaume can take over and just talk about what we learned in the end uh, through this um, app. So this application, we called it Pika Daily. Um, it's a picture sharing application. That's why it's Pika Daily. And the reason why we also called it Pika Daily is because it, it was for a customer in London. So we wanted to play the um, with the name of Piccadilly Circus in, in London. But in this application, um, it's actually part of a workshop now. So if you go to this link, um, this link here, uh, there are six labs where you can actually build this application. And the code is also on GitHub. Um, so all the code is open source, so you can take a look if you like. But the main things about this application is that um, users upload some pictures um, to this app. And then once users upload the pictures, we do a little bit of analysis on these pictures and we figure out what the picture is about using machine learning. So we, so we extract what's called labels from these pictures. And we also extract the dominant colors of the picture. And then we use it as a, as a border around the picture. So you can see that we, each picture has a border with the dominant color and each picture also has some labels uh, about, about what the picture is about. So this is mainly the app. And then there's a collage section where we also display a collage of pictures from the four most recent pictures. It's a very simple app, but the point is to show, you know, the serverless um, technologies of Google Cloud to our customers and people who want to use Google Cloud. Now, initially, when we designed this application, we took an event-driven approach. And just to go through the architecture quickly, um, we have users uploading pictures to our front end. And for the front end, we are using App Engine, uh, which is Google's basically um, solution for web, uh, web applications. So the users use App Engine to upload the picture. This goes to um, Google Cloud Storage, which is an object storage uh, of Google Cloud. And then once the picture is saved, that triggers a number of events. The first event goes to um, a cloud function. Um, and in this cloud function, we analyze the picture using Vision API, and then we save the, the analysis to Firestore, which is a NoSQL database. The second event goes to a Cloud Run service. Uh, cloud Run, it's a container service. So it runs containers as, as, as a serverless, almost like a serverless function, but it's for containers. So the, the second event goes to that, but the difference in this case is that there's no direct native event integration between Cloud Storage and Cloud Run. So we had to go through PubSub. So it's a different event type. And then the Cloud Run service, thumbnail service, will look at the image, uh, usually big image size, and then it will try to create a smaller version of that image. It will create a thumbnail. So it, it does that, and it saves the, the thumbnail image back, and it also stores that information to Firestore. Then we have another uh, service called Collage Service. It's a Cloud Run service, so it's running a container again. That gets triggered on a schedule. And then um, on this schedule, um, it will go and fetch, ask the NoSQL database, what are my four most recent pictures? It will determine that, and it will download these pictures, and it will create a collage and save the collage back to our storage. And finally, we have a last service called Garbage Collector Service. Uh, this gets triggered. Uh, when an image is deleted. So when an image is deleted, uh, this service will be called and it will delete the thumbnail and it will delete, delete the metadata of this service. And again, this service gets triggered by event arc, yet another uh, eventing service. Um, the reason why we use event arc here is that at the time we implemented this service, there was no event arc. So we had to go through PubSub. But then when we implemented this service, event arc came along and made things easier. So we used that, but that also introduced another format in our um, architecture. So as you can see, this is all event driven. All these services, they exist on their own. They don't know about each other. They don't care about each other. And, and that's it really. And it works and it's great. But we were, even though this is a very simple architecture and very simple app, we were already running into problems with this architecture. We were already, for example, when someone uploads a picture and something doesn't work, we were already kind of lost, like where this where this failed. So what we would normally do is that we would basically start looking at the logs one by one and see, okay, did image analysis work? Yes, it worked, great. Then the thumbnail service worked? Oh, um, no. So we had to kind of 
basically guess where things might not work and then look into that service. Um, similarly, these eventing formats, we had three different kinds of events. We had the native cloud function events, pop up events, and um, cloud run events. We had to handle these in our code. So you can see these different three different event formats and how we handle them in, in, in this Node.js code. Um, in cloud function, it's a straight event that you get, which is great. In um, pops up, you get a pops up message that has the actual cloud storage event that's wrapped into base64, right? So what you need to do is you need to look at the pops up message, you need to get the message data of the pops up message, then you need to base64 decode it, and then you will actually get the file event. And then the, with the event arc events, you get a cloud event, which is an audit block. So that's a different format that you had to deal with, right? So you can see that this was getting quite complicated. That's when we started looking into orchestration. Um, and at the beginning of the year, uh, workflows became GA. And we said, OK, why don't we take this app and convert into a workflow, basically, in an orchestrated kind of approach? And in the end, we came up with this architecture. Um, so when you look at this, you might be thinking, oh, you know, this looks even more complicated. Uh, it does look like that, but actually, in reality, it's simpler. The reason is all this flow chart that I'm showing here, it's actually one service. It's cloud, uh, Google Cloud Workflows. So Google Cloud Workflows is doing all this work, but we are just giving you the detail here uh, with the flow chart. So you can think of all of this as one service. So in this approach, the way it works is that the user still upload the image to App Engine Frontend that triggers the event just like before. And that event gets to a cloud function. Um, so this event is either fi file creation event or file deletion event. And this cloud function, um, it will basically start the orchestration. So it will make a call to workflows. And in, now we're in workflows. Then workflows will um, decide what kind of event this is. So if it's a deletion event, then it will do the image garbage collection and and also the Firestore garbage collection. So all this is done within workflows without having to write the code. It's, it's, it's just the YAML that we define. Then if it's an object finalized, we meaning a new uh, image, then workflows makes a call to Vision API. Again, we don't need a cloud function for this. Um, workflows will do that uh, directly. Then we need to transform that a little bit, uh, what we receive from Vision API. So for that, we use a cloud function. Then workflows will determine whether the picture is safe or not. And if it's safe, it will save it to Google Cloud Firestore. And if it's not safe, it, it, if it, and if it's safe also, it will do the thumbnail call and the collage call. So it will, it will make the calls to the Cloud Run services. Mm -hmm. So as you can see in this approach, we are kind of doing a little bit of, um, some of the work is being done in, in workflows. Like for example, image garbage collection, uh, vision API call, uh, things like that is done within workflows. But then some of the work we delegate to other, other things. Like, uh, for example, for thumbnail call, we um, just call the thumbnail service. And for collage call, we call it the collage service. So you can kind of pick and choose some, some things you, you do within your workflows and some things you can delegate. So this is it. And I, I actually, let, before we get into the lessons learned, I think we still have 10 minutes. So I want to um, maybe um, show you um, the app. So this is the app. And if I, I, if I want to just upload a picture, I'll just upload a quick picture and just see how it looks like. So let's say I am uploading this picture, submit. Then this picture is being processed. And then if I refresh, pretty, pretty hopefully, if things work, uh, this should update the image. But we can actually take a look. So I can go to my Google Cloud Console. I can look at workflows. And you see that the, I have my workflow definition here. And you can see that there's this um, execution that's active, that's running, uh, that triggered our workflow. And if I look at the source, you can see the source of my workflow. It's all YAML driven. And then you can also get a visualization of our workflow, how things work. So this really helps to understand what's happening. And if you go back to executions, uh, it's still active. But if you look at a successful execution, you can see what the input is, and you can see what the output is, um, and you determine what this output should be. So here, what we are using is that we are basically calling each service and getting the HTTP status code, code and combine it together into an output. So you can see how everything is like very um, nice, to, nice, and, and you can see the executions. And if something goes wrong, you can click on the execution. You can see the steps. 
where things failed. So this really made things much easier and uh, clear for us. So I'll just stop here for now and, and I'll let Guillaume explain to us in more detail about the lessons learned in the last 10 minutes of our presentation. So I'll stop sharing. So yeah, lessons learned. Um, so what was great was that we were back to using RESTful services and the you know handling uh, of REST API. It's quite refreshing compared to the various eventing formats that we had to use. Although, I mean, there were some good reasons for each of those eventing formats. Uh, but still, that was nice to have just one way of handling that. Also, what was pretty cool is that uh, we had less code ultimately. So as uh, Mete explained uh, when he was showing the diagram with the architecture and the workflow underneath, um, some of the, um, for, for example, the garbage collection service uh, vanished away because it only contained uh, actually uh, declarative calls, API declarative calls. Uh, so we got rid of just that bit, those bits of code which were calling that those APIs directly. And instead we just encoded them uh, in the YAML definition file, basically. We didn't have to do even parsing. We were just uh, you know, fetching the uh, body of the API called response and just parse that uh, as JSON document, basically. There was also less setup. So just the setup for cloud workflows, but otherwise no need to set up the uh, uh, pub sub, the topics, the subscriptions, etc. No need for scheduler. One of the um, service, the one that was creating collage of uh, the recent pictures, uh, it was being invoked on a scheduler at a regular interval of time. Here we didn't need to use that because once there was a new picture available, we would create the the new collage. No event arc either. So overall, much less setup uh, to get ready and and do, do our do our job, our business processes. Uh, we also had easier error handling because, um, so first of all, error handling was handled at the level of the workflow definition instead of at uh, potentially each service or on the topic um, configuration, things like that. Also, what was great is that when there was an error in that business process, uh, the, the whole chain would stop uh, on error. And we were we we could look at the like the UI or uh, from the command line etc to see what where at which step that failed and what triggered the the, the failure for example looking at the logs etc instead of the uh, even driven approach where sometimes uh, you see potentially in the logs or in error reporting etc that there was a problem but you are not quite sure what really triggered that problem which of the uh, parallel executions potentially uh, led to that. So in order to do correlation between different service executions, it, it could be complicated with a choreography approach. Whereas here, we just have to look at this particular execution to know the, 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 the chain of calls or the sequence uh, of calls, how they uh, actually worked. The downsides, uh, well, when we started with Cloud Workflows, Google Cloud Workflows, it was a brand new product. So there were some quirks or documentation that wasn't yet uh, you know, great. So we had to fight a little bit with that, but now obviously um, six months in or so, uh, things have evolved nicely and uh, it's much nicer to, to, to read through the documentation to figure out new, new things. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that um, don't try to put too much in, a, in the YAML definition file. What is really programming logic needs to be in a service. It shouldn't be in a YAML file, okay? Uh, YAML is not a programming language, although you can do you know, loops and whatever in, a, in, in the YAML and the workflow definition. Uh, please don't do that. So be sure to uh, make a, uh, de de declarative calls to API in the YAML, that's fine. But it, it's really you know, complicated business logic. It's probably not, uh, it's really, I mean, the orchestrator is, is for orchestrating services, but it's not to removing business logic uh, from services, right? Um, the other aspect that is sometimes complicated, it's debugging, testing, logging, et cetera. When you're used to ju just programming, uh, your ID is there to help with code completion, um, 
uh, you know, those little bubbles of help uh, saying, okay, this parameter is doing this, etc. So uh, it's less convenient to describe things in a YAML file compared to writing code, basically. So although you have some facilities for logging, for things like that, uh, it's not as convenient as a programming language. Perhaps a bit of lost parallelism, for example, in the first approach with choreography, we used to have, um, for example, the thumbnail service and the um, image analysis service launched at the same time in parallel. Uh, so the first one that would finish, uh, instead of doing a sequence and waiting for each to finish, uh, both uh, would be ready more or less at the same time. On the other hand, we were actually calling those two services in parallel, even if potentially uh, the image wasn't safe to display, so we wouldn't need to create a thumbnail. We wouldn't need to store the metadata about the picture in the database. So perhaps less parallelism, but on the other hand, we also saved a bit on, on, on CPU resources. Uh, also potentially some loss of eventing flexibility. We mentioned when we spoke about choreography that one of the pros is the fact that it's, it's easy to extend event-driven system, just add new events, new messages on a message broker, or subscribe to existing topics and existing uh, types of messages. Uh, here, you would have to revalidate your business process in, in the workflow definition as soon as you want to expand it uh, a, a little bit. But overall, uh, that was a really nice uh, experience for us. And uh, when we rewrote the, that application, the Pico Daily application, uh, that was really much more straightforward to figure out when something was going wrong, uh, seeing the, the visualization of the really the flow chart of our business process, having uh, the ability to also version that in Git, et cetera, that, that was really refreshing for us. And uh, well, we encourage you to actually have a look at the, uh, the code of this uh, uh, application uh, since it's available on, on GitHub as open source. And also have a look at some of these links, which will uh, give you some extra information about workflows, uh, about some tips on using workflows, and also some quick starts and uh, code labs if you want. To, <clears throat> sorry, if you want to get your hands on uh, the th those projects and, and products. And that's about it uh, for this presentation. Do we have? Thank you, guys. Uh, thanks for the great. Thanks for the great presentation, and thank you for sharing the the, the actual experience you had, uh, which is which makes the presentation a lot richer. Uh, we have a couple of questions. I'm going to mm -hmm. try to be quick on them. Uh, we only have two minutes. So we have two questions on transactions. So one for for the part where Guillaume was uh, presenting the orchestration tool, uh, which is how do you manage global transaction? You need to write specific compensation mechanisms on error. Uh, and the second question on, um, on transactions is, then uh, this is for the actual project that you were presenting. So um, how, how uh, is a transaction handled if it is failed in thumbnail or collage? How is, how is it uh, rolled back? Yeah, so um, when, when I say transaction, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, a GX, XT8 kind of transactions. And indeed, if you have written something to the database, at some point, at the, like the beginning of the workflow, and then uh, something fail later on. Uh, yes, indeed, you might have to write compensation uh, transaction or operations to compensate uh, some of the stuff. So it's not a part of, uh, let's say, the, the product itself, but it's you, how you define your workflow definitions that potentially, uh, so since you can specify uh, error handling, the various cases, how it can fail. Instead of letting the workflow fail, be sure to. So we, we have try, accept kind of blocks around API calls that you can specify. Uh, so at that point, you could say, okay, so this failed, uh, then I'm going to do the compensation as part of the, of the yeah. workflow definition. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Uh, um, we really need to wrap up. Um, okay. Thanks a lot for, we had another question, but uh, I'm, I'm going to suggest the, the, the guys to contact you on Twitter if possible, or yep. uh, yes. so they can get their questions answered. So Thank thanks you. a lot, guys, for the great presentation. Uh, we'll be back in 10 minutes with Brian Premier 
on with a session on Docker. So see you in 10. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for your attention.